solved in both of those scenarios. And there is a deep cognitive dissonance in Washington that, you know, Biden pretends to be woke all of a sudden now. But yeah, (laughs) this this includes that, too. I mean, you've got to have an international perspective on this. It's like a disgusting statement by Biden, who seemed like he didn't even want to be there. I have no doubt he didn't want to be there. (laughs) Um, All right. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we'll be talking to Jamie Skillen. He is an associate professor of environmental studies and director of the Calvin Ecosystem Preserve and Native Gardens at Calvin University in Grand Rapids, Michigan. His book, uh, This Land is My Land, Rebellion in the West. We will uh, talk about that in a moment. We'll be right back. In the meantime, uh, today's sponsor is BetterHelp Online Counseling. Um, They're giving our audience 10% off their first month when you go to betterhelp.com slash majority report. BetterHelp gives you access to your own fully licensed and accredited therapist via phone, chat, or video. Uh, A lot of therapists, as you know, right now in particular, (laughs) um, have long wait lists. It can take weeks, months sometimes before they can see you. But when you sign up with BetterHelp, they match you with a therapist based on your specific needs. You'll be communicating with them in less than 24 hours. Uh, Look, particularly during COVID, but frankly, um, at all times, very helpful to, um, to have someone to talk to, to work th- out uh, specific issues, general issues. Uh, therapy has uh, always played a big role in my life at uh, different times, more or less. Uh, but uh, difficult, particularly right now, the stress is off the charts, even uh, people coming back. I think there's a little post-traumatic, uh, frankly, uh, quality to sort of coming out of, uh, of uh, a pandemic and, and sort of this netherworld. Uh, very good time to see a therapist. And the beauty of uh, BetterHelp is that, A, uh, there are no long lines. B, once BetterHelp connects you with a therapist, if it is not a good fit, it's not working out, for whatever reason, you can switch to a new one. You can do so at any time uh, for no additional charge. They have thousands of licensed therapists. They're from all over the country. Sometimes maybe you're looking for a therapist who deals with a specific uh, issue that you're having, a specialty. You can find them through BetterHelp. BetterHelp also tends to be more affordable than therapists you'd find through traditional means. You don't have to have insurance to use BetterHelp, and they have financial aid options for those who qualify. BetterHelp has given everyone in our audience 10% off your first month. When you go to betterhelp.com slash majority report, that's betterhelp, H E L P dot com slash majority report. You can find the URL in the video description. If you're watching this on YouTube, it will be in our podcast description. If you're listening to the program, um, do we have, uh, Jamie? We do. Okay. I want to welcome to the program Associate Professor of Environmental Studies and Director of the Calvin Ecosystem Preserve and Native Gardens at Calvin University in Grand Rapids, author of This Land is My Land, Rebellion in the West, uh, Jamie Skillen. Jamie, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for having me. Uh, and I'm here with uh, Emma Vigland. Um, uh, really appreciate you coming to talk to us about it. Uh, really, so the... Essentially, what your book uh, uh, covers is really uh, on some level the 50, almost the 50, uh, the, the past 50 years of, of rebellions around the uh, federal land use and control and how over this period of time, the rebellions have become almost sort of less narrowly tailored and, and less sort of materially based or maybe I shouldn't say less, but they've expanded um, to to be more uh, almost ideological and, and sort of tied into sort of other ideas, conservative things that are happening around the country. I did not realize uh, that when you're looking from the Rockies West, 45% of that land is owned by our government. Uh, in Alaska, it's over 60%. That is um, uh, pretty stunning. But let's start with the the sagebrush rebellions um i i was wasn't familiar with those actually and we should say that this is going to lead us up 
in some ways to January 6th in an odd way. But let's start with the sagebrush rebellions. What 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 were they and um, why? Right. It's a good question. And uh, I want to emphasize, you know, it is such a different reality in the American West where the federal government is the dominant land use planner. Uh, so in the state of Nevada is 83 percent federally owned. So when the federal government sneezes in that region, uh, people feel it. And the Sagebrush Rebellion, which sort of launched in 1979, is a reaction to uh, a series of laws that Congress passed, mainly in the 1970s. And those laws reshaped federal land management, uh, particularly throughout the West. And for a lot of uh, Westerners, particularly those who used what had been the public domain lands, and they'd use those lands with limited regulation, limited oversight, uh, Congress's new laws sort of said, wait, we're going to have professional land managers make more of the decisions. And so particularly ranchers began to feel a real shift that the ranches that had felt like their own uh, were now being run by you know, people with ecology degrees. Um, and there was a frustration of the growing regulation and I think the reduced resource development. So I mentioned ranching, but also frustration with new developments in logging, in mining, and in other areas. And so the Sagebrush Rebellion is essentially when Western states, uh, led by Nevada, began to pass legislation saying uh, incorrectly that federal land rightfully belong to the states and not to the federal government. And as you said, that rebellion was really, it was a regional conflict. It was waged by Westerners who had a material interest in those lands and resources. And I should add, it was waged, it was a bipartisan rebellion. There were Democrats and Republicans in those state legislatures who were fighting federal control. Well, so, uh, I mean, just speak to, the how aligned the interests were between ranchers, right, who are ostensibly, well, I, maybe characterize ranchers for us, because, um, I, you know, when I think of a rancher, I think like, oh, it's, a, you know, I don't know, a, it's a family and they, they have a, you know, their small plot of land, or maybe it's a little bigger plot of land, and they raise some cattle and maybe some other livestock and uh, you know, it's sort of like, uh, the evolution of the Ponderosa, I guess. And, um, and then when I think of loggers and, um, miners, I start to think of bigger corporations and almost like multinationals, like where, where, where do they meet? How hard was that, uh, to sort of, I guess, cement that relationship so that they could provide some type of, um, uh, political pressure on, on particularly in Nevada in the late uh, legislature. The uh, in 1979, the Sagebrush Rebellion really wasn't focused on federal lands as a whole. So they weren't really arguing about national parks, for example. The focus was on what would be called public lands managed by the Bureau of Land Management. And those lands don't have a lot of timber value outside of Oregon. So the main issues were mining and grazing. And for a rancher in the West, uh, it is very, very difficult to have a ranch operating entirely on private land. It's almost impossible. Uh, you know, in the West, there are areas where you might need 100 acres per cow in order to uh, feed them for a year. And so a rancher who might own, you know, 500 acres privately held or deeded land might need 750,000 acres in order to make a good living. And so the ranchers in the West uh, have historically been dependent on access to these vast federal acres just to survive. I mean, ranching in the inner mountain West uh, with, where there's very little rainfall, it's a tough way to make a living. I mean, how like, you know, and, and this will come up when we start talking about the Bundys and, and whatnot, but how, sure. Sort of like, how, how conscious was it that they're getting a government subsidy, right? I mean, like this is, I mean, I own some land, you know, if it was private land, their neighbors probably wouldn't say like, yeah, sure, 
just yeah, have them come graze, right. you know, whenever, whenever, whenever it works for you guys, you know, we're okay right. with that. I mean, if it was private land, they'd say like, yeah, you can graze, but here's how much it's going to cost. Um, and if you don't like it, you know, start a different business or something. H- how conscious were these, um, uh, are these ranchers of that dynamic or how do they see it? So, you know, generalizing, what I would say is, certainly in the late seventies, but even today, public lands ranchers don't see uh, their access to the land as a subsidy. And part of it is we all understand ourselves through stories, through our history. And if you go back to when people settled the Intermountain West and began running livestock on those public lands, those lands were known as just the public domain. And there was no regulation. There was no management. There was no oversight. And that was legal. So, Uh, what a lot of ranchers would say is they're the ones who are actually managing the land on behalf of the country. They were the ones putting in improvements like fences and, uh, and wells and water. And uh, so when, and even, I mean, to give an example of this uh, in 19, around 1930, 1931, president Hoover offered to give all of that public domain land to the Western States. And they said, no, that they didn't want it. Um, so for a lot of ranchers, it was this experience of, listen, we're the only ones who care about this land. We're putting our blood and sweat into it. So there was a real sense that there was an ownership of that land. Uh, and when the federal government began to regulate it, beginning in the 30s, ranchers were OK with a very, very modest fee. Uh, but they saw that fee as really just paying for the services of management. And when the federal government began saying, no, we're going to tell you how many cows you can graze, or we're going to tell you when the grazing season is, then ranchers felt like the federal government was really restricting their private property. And I think that sense uh, continues today. Um, Tell us about the, um, I guess this is where the Bundy family uh, comes in uh, through these um, uh, sagebrush rebellions. Um, so when they're, you know, when their history goes back to, uh, the early 1900s, I guess, and their family, this, you know, this land presumably, right. I mean, for their, to maintain their ownership, I guess it's pass it or down from my dad, from his dad, et cetera, et cetera. And I do mean dad, right. Um, at least in the case of the Bundys. So what, um, uh, like just give us a little background as to their relationship, uh, to these rebellions. Yeah, when Clive and Bundy, who is uh, sort of the current patriarch of the Bundy family, when Clive and Bundy began ranching, he was working with his family ranch. And uh, when he took over uh, in the 1970s, this is just when federal regulation began to impinge on his sense of ownership and freedom. And so his ranch, like many in the West, uh, you know, he has private land deeded land. He depended on tens of thousands of acres of federal land. And actually what he began to experience was just new regulations, higher costs that he was having to pay the federal government. And here, if, you know, if if viewers want to get into some of the weeds, that one of the really complicating issues that I'm empathetic with is uh, there's an interesting relationship in the West between land and water that's hard to appreciate if you live in the East. And to say it very quickly, the Bundy family owns or has rights to surface water, and those rights are given by the state of Nevada. They can only exercise those rights if they have cattle grazing on federal land, drinking that water. And so when the federal government began to tell the Bundy family, hey, you can't have as many cows, not only was that hurting them economically, but they began to worry that they might lose their water rights as well. Can you expand on the just that period in the 1970s when fr- from the federal government, there were things like the Endangered Species Act coming down um, and just how the confluence of those things informed, um, you know, this exact dynamic. And then, of course, came to the head with the uh, the Bundy incident of right. a few years back. Yeah, the federal government really wasn't involved in environmental regulation until the late 1960s in a meaningful way. And I'll just highlight three laws 
there was something called the National Environmental Policy Act, 1969, the Endangered Species Act of 19. 